the focus here today is on mental health and MS. And if you know you haven't been aware, obviously mental health has gotten a lot more conversation in mainstream media in a bunch of different domains. And uh, in MS, it's been something that we've been talking about for, for many, many years. Um, in, in part because we know that both anxiety and depression are more common in people living with MS than in the general population. Now, of course, uh, mental health includes far more than, than anxiety and depression, but for the sake of this conversation, that's gonna be mostly what we focus on. Uh, we know that at least half of the people with MS experience at least one depressive episode in their life, and that a third experience some sort of anxiety disorder. So a part of uh, when we start to see the numbers go up like this compared to the general population, uh, we, we should rightly be starting to ask some of the questions of, of why, why is that? And we're going to see some more of that information here today. And I encourage uh, everyone, if you have further questions or you'll, you'll hear me say this throughout the talk, um, in need help or assistance, you know, have these conversations with your providers um, and to get some more details about maybe what's been affecting you. Um, we know that we look at rates of depression in MS, it's 50% higher than the general population. And we know that MS obviously cross cuts the general population. So there has to be something else going on with MS that leads to these uh, really 50% higher rates of depression. And there are a variety of theories, we'll, we'll touch on those a little bit. Um, but it's important to note that when we talk about depression, uh, we are we do need to differentiate from grief. Um, grief is different than depression. Um, sometimes it's this idea of the grief reaction is really one that we can identify, almost identify a cause with. Something happens, we, we may grieve a loss, we may grieve a diagnosis, whatever it may be. Oftentimes, when we start talking about uh, depression, it has a tendency to lack that specific cause. So like if the cause were resolved, like with grief, if it were possible, you may not grieve anymore. With depression, it has a much higher likelihood of being extensive and go on for longer periods of time and includes often uh, much more complexity of, of symptoms um, than, than maybe grief will. Next slide, please. So this slide uh, is a really great slide that both applies to uh, breaking apart and uh, talking about depression, but also anxiety. So we talked about this idea of you know depression being different from normal grieving, uh, because depression in MS in uh, particular can actually be caused by or influenced by the activity of MS itself. So whether you know um, it's the inflammation, the inflammatory processes, we know that. Um, one theory of depression in general, that there's an inflammatory component to it. So disease activity absolutely can lead to either A, uh, new experiences of depression or an increase in depressive symptoms that may have already been there to begin with. So it's important to understand that it can make pre-existing depression worse or it absolutely can in people who have never had any depressive symptoms before cause a new um, experience of depression. The lesions themselves, in part, it could be uh, the number, the load, the location, both have been shown to also cause depressive episodes. Um, and there are some that seem like that they're a little bit more obvious in some regards. Uh, and, and so, you know, we start talking about how MS can affect people's lives. Um, of course, you know, changes in disability, you know, if someone has a much more difficult time ambulating, it can be a lot harder to get out of the house or it can be a lot harder to feel motivated to do things. And I say obvious because sometimes um, those are the ones that we kind of hang our hat on the most saying, well, of course I have MS, what would you expect? And yet, obviously we also have to recognize that there are other really genuine like, disease activity pieces um, which also may help us better understand how to treat it. Um, side effects from some of the medications that are used to treat MS can absolutely cause experiences uh, of depression to, to increase. So, you know, similar to, to this, when we come back to understanding anxiety, um, it would be important to talk with your provider um, 
you know, if there are certain, whether they're disease modifying medications, symptom management medications, um, whatever they may be to see if some of those side effects, especially if they may coincide with your depressive symptoms uh, might be coming from those medications. Doesn't mean that it's just simply, well, I just changed medications, but it doesn't mean that at all. However, what it may mean is help you understand that uh, sequence or that cause or that etiology of the depressive symptoms. It might help you better understand how you can combat it a little bit. Next slide, please. As we said, uh, as I said before, you know, a third of the people living with MS report experiencing some type of anxiety during the course of their disease. Again, this absolutely can be caused by um, changes in the brain, very physical or physical changes. Um, can be caused by medication. If anyone, uh, which I'm sure there's oodles of people on this on this call, have had um, the IV steroids or really any, even the or oral steroids. And if you've ever felt really anxious or, or really irritable afterwards, that's a prime example of how anxiety can be caused by a medication. Um, it can also be very anxiety provoking when you're having difficulties, uh, let's just say with mobility and your, or, or it could be mobility, it could be bowel or bladder, and you plan on going out somewhere, right? And you start thinking about, oh my gosh, uh, am I going to, where's the bathroom? Am I going to be able to make it? Am I going to fall? All of those conversations that you have in your head can clearly lead to increases in anxiety. So it's important that uh, we, we talk a little bit about ways to uh, strategize around that. And, and I think that those are um, maybe not necessarily the big pieces that we'll get into today, but certainly things to be talking about when we say, yeah, how do you may strategize a little bit? Next slide, please. All right. So um, this is a really this is a really great slide at the next one as well. Um, we start talking about, well, how do you deal with this? How do you deal with depression? How do you deal with anxiety? How do you cope? Um, and I like these really broad categories because what it allows you to do, I almost describe this as a basic recipe, if you will, for uh, baking your favorite basic cookie. Um, each of these represents one basic component, the flour, the eggs, the water, whatever. You need to then take this and apply it to the world that you live in and mix in the things that are specific for you. So depending on what your lifestyle looks like where you live, are you living in uh, a very urban area? Are you living in a rural area where maybe resources are a little bit harder to come by? Um, certainly um, those lifestyle changes can be affected by you know, what's available to us. Um, some of that is nutrition, some of that is um, of course, exercise, relaxation techniques and mindfulness. Uh, you know, not every relaxation uh, technique is, you know, works for everybody. So I usually tell people, you know, the more you can have in your toolbox, you're bound to find someone, uh, some of them as you learn them that you just don't like, that just don't work for you. So I'd say, you know, don't beat yourself over the head trying to, you know, force yourself to use one that is just a struggle. So having a variety of techniques and in, in mindfulness is one of those. Um, you know, getting uh, help from a therapist, uh, you know, that could be a psychologist, a, a social worker, a counselor, and if nothing, um, and I, I always hesitate to say that there's anything but a, like a silver lining that has come out of some of what's gone on with the pandemic, um, but if that's, if you could say that, you know, the advent and the explosion of these mobile apps and virtual experiences like we have right now have really, really, um, given people opportunities to connect like never before. And in fact, many of you living with MS at the start of the pandemic, when we were all switching over to, to this virtual world and, and being in the house and dealing, you all were already very skilled beyond where many of us were, because this is part of the life that you had been adjusting to over the course of time with your disease. So attending either virtual or in-person support groups, you know, that's certainly important. And then this receiving support from family and friends and that definition of family and friends varies for everybody. Um, some people may not have a really extended family that they can rely on or their family is defined differently. Maybe it's a church family, maybe it's a, uh, you know, a temple family, maybe it's um, the neighbor is, is family. But that's why I say you need to apply the very specific definition for the world that you live in and not get hung up on, well, my family just isn't very supportive and start to look beyond that. Next slide, please. Um, you know, when you should get help. Of course, if you're noticing any of these signs, a lot of places, a lot of um, 
healthcare facilities, depending on your, if you're going to an MS center or a lot of even just neuro, neurology offices, doctor's offices are screening for things like depression and anxiety on a regular basis. Um, and, and in fact, uh, I had an appointment with my primary care doctor yesterday and they're like, oh, it's time for your annual depression screening. So a lot of people are asking this stuff on a regular basis. Um, if you're struggling with symptoms that are present for more than two weeks, um, it's probably a good time to, to get some help outside of the immediate world that you live in. So a professional um, contact your you know, healthcare provider when it starts to impact your day-to-day -day functioning. If you're having trouble you know, getting up in the morning, getting to work, getting to your therapy, and you're just not feeling it, that would be a great time to uh, enlist the support of professional care. Um, and professional care, other resources, the National MS Society, the MS Navigators can help direct you to what's available. Uh, really cool in the last year or so, the, uh, that 988, which is the National Suicide uh, Crisis Hotline, that uh, used to be the 1-800 number, but 988, um, it's, it's awesome, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Um, somebody will answer the phone and um, they're a trained crisis counselor, or you can text help to 741-741. Next slide, please. How do you treat these things? It's like a lot of um, any, any real mental health um, issues. It's a combination of things. Some people, medication is, um, is something that they either are, are on board with, want, um, you know, we know that the combination of medication and therapy in particular has the best, you know, benefits. Um, sometimes people are not necessarily uh, keen on a trial of medication for things like depression or anxiety. One thing that I would um, just caution you on, if you're a person with MS and having symptoms of depression and anxiety, um, remember that it's different than the everyday average person who has symptoms of depression and anxiety that because of the disease, the symptoms can come out of nowhere. And it may be something where if you're struggling and let's just say therapy alone doesn't seem to be working, that what you're dealing with in terms of the physiological processes in the brain may need just that little bit of, of tweaking from a medication standpoint to help you. And so um, considering that it might be different than if you didn't have MS and had depression and maybe felt like you could just kind of push through it, um, might be an option that you want to consider a little sooner. Of course, we know we have social support. We have something to look forward to at the end of the week, at the end of the month. Certainly, certainly, certainly. We know, we say, oh, I'm going to do this on Friday or we're going to have to play games, whatever. That, that helps. Okay. Um, and, you know, lastly, this interdisciplinary care. I mean, not this isn't available to everybody. Okay. And, and, and we recognize that where you may not have the, um, the great fortune of being able to have your neurologist and your rehab and your psychologist and your social worker all working closely together. Uh, and that's not, that, that may be, but it may be then that you have to kind of piecemeal a little bit of that and do a little bit of the leg working connecting these people, um, especially if it's not there naturally. So the working and having your team work together can be really, really helpful. Um, and from a psychology standpoint, looking for providers who offer what we would call evidence-based behavioral treatment. So cognitive behavioral therapy, acceptance and commitment therapy, um, those are really very common. But I will also say that sometimes uh, you have to try a few therapists, the different kinds of strategies, and um, find something that works for you. Okay, that's, you know, and you can certainly go through the MS Navigator and things like that to get some um, guidance on that and looking for a therapist who um, has the MS uh, specialization can be very, very helpful. Next slide, please. All right, and I know that this was talked about a little bit already. Um, so one of the, um, this idea of resiliency being something that uh, is, again, garnered a lot of attention lately. This idea of resilience being the ability to, to kind of pick yourself up and move forward when something knocks you down. And, you know, when you um, find strategies, look for support, you get things that kind of help. You do it again. When you have success, you do it again. You look for um, whatever it could be in the community around you, uh, strategies through therapy, things like that. Um, but when you get the confidence, something knocks you down, maybe you have a relapse, and you got to figure out your way through, and you're able to get through, then you're understanding your um, what you can do uh, and feeling confident because you made it through this time can be really helpful the next time. So when you have success, it can lead to more success. And that's something with mental well-being as well. We can say, oh, you know, I've been through this before. These depressive symptoms go away and they go away when I work hard at them and I can do this. And that can lead to kind of that cycle in a different direction, the spiral in a positive direction for you. Um, 